got my doctorate at Utah State University and I was a high school English teacher and literacy coach. I think the eye chart works as a nice intermediate step, so I wouldn't take out webbing altogether. What I'm going to present to you tonight is a project that I've been working on with uh, Kim Ward's fourth grade classroom at Monmouth Elementary School. I have a lot of samples of books that kids in her classroom have written. And the last two years that I've been here, I've worked in her classroom for about two to three months each year. And I go into her classroom every day during writing time and I teach writing with her. And it's been a really exciting experience to work on writing with those kids. The thing that we wanted to work on with her students is they were doing a lot of reading and guided reading and they were very confident in their reading of fiction texts. I think kids get a really good sense of story throughout the elementary school years. They understand that characters are in books and that there's a setting and there's usually a conflict and it's resolved. And teachers really enjoy reading aloud to them. But what they're not getting a lot of is textbook reading or the, or the foundation that gets them ready for the success of the kind of reading that they'll do later in school. And so in a lot of the literacy research, it kind of presents itself as a false separation. What usually appears is we call K through three or pre-K to three the learning to read years. And we focus a lot on those skills that kids learn that help them to decode text, to sound out text, to recognize words. Uh, we focus somewhat on understanding, but a lot of the text that they read is very much aligned with their grade level. And so we hope that if they can decode and they can attach it to the vocabulary that they have, that meaning will occur. Now we know that a lot of kids uh, are, do really well with this kind of teaching, and we call that the simple model of reading. But one of the things that I figured out as a high school teacher, and I think probably most of you would as adult readers, is that the kind of reading you do at the lower elementary stage, uh, if you don't get a lot of practice with it and you don't start to feel independent, we lose a lot of our readers. So what usually happens at the fourth through twelfth grade phase is this reading to learn phase where we're no longer learning how to read, we're using our reading to learn from it. And what we find is kids who don't have this super strong foundation when they move into that, we start to lose them. And so in the research literature, it's called the achievement gap, this reading slump or the fourth grade slump that they call it. And so when I was working with a lot of my students who had come through the system, even those who were really strong readers, there was one thing that we usually introduced around fourth or fifth grade that turned a lot of kids off to reading. Can you guess what it is? that we introduce into their reading lexicon that probably turns them off to reading. And it really becomes something that rules the roost in high school. A lot of instruction is driven by this. Nonfiction texts. Yes, and more specifically, textbooks. We kill kids reading with textbooks. And a lot of it is because it's very different than the kind of reading that they've done um, and had guided for them with their teachers. A lot of kids do fine with it, but a lot of kids, uh, that's where we start to see their motivation drop. We start to see that we expect that the reading that they've done in the early grades just sets them up for it. And we don't give them a lot of information that helps them make the transition from reading in fictional text to nonfiction text. And so we get this gap. Now, I also wanted to show you because it was really, I was trying to figure out who my audience was since it's a community thing, but I knew there were teachers coming and other, other people. So I thought I'd also introduce you to the Common Core Standards. Now, raise your hand if you're familiar with the Common Core State Standards. Our local high school English teacher is familiar with the Common Core Standards. Mary is because she's in teacher education. Have you heard of the Common Core Standards? At least heard it. The Common Core Standards were probably started to be adopted about five years ago across the nation. And there's much you could critique, but there's also a lot that uh, I think can be beneficial to us as teachers. And one of the things that is common to the Common Core Standards is there are 10 anchor standards that grow across grades. So they start off with fairly simple standards for reading, like in this strand, read closely. So in kindergarten, students wouldn't take the text and look at making explicit connections and logical inferences. That's a little bit above what we would expect a kindergarten reader to do. But the standard at kindergarten would say they'll learn to read closely, pay attention to letters and phonemes and sounds. So it builds as it goes up the grade level. Now I brought the fourth grade standards and what I've done, and I think that this is a really nice way to divide the standards, is they're in three groups. So the first three standards are, they call them key ideas and details. 
I would say that that says, what does the text say? If I had to read these standards and summarize them, I would want to know, what does the text say? How would I summarize it? And what's the message? I'm going to skip the middle one. The bottom one is integration of knowledge and ideas. And those are the standards that really address comprehension. What does the text mean? How do I get meaning from a text? Uh, can I evaluate arguments? Can I look at how two texts address similar themes and topics? And then the third piece in the middle is craft and structure. And that is what does the text do? Or how does the author do what they do? How do they make the text say what it says? And I think that this is a really important and pivotal standard because the other thing that's often neglected and many of our older students suffer from is a real aversion to writing. And so I think if we can get them to read like writers, we have a really good chance of having those two skills build on each other to help them to be able to understand the text because they're paying attention to those cues, but then to also be able to replicate that kind of text when they do their own writing. And I know as an English teacher from the high school level that students have to write. And this is one of the things even at the college level that we're always concerned with is our students writing skills. Are they able to say what they know, tell us in writing what they've learned, and demonstrate their understanding? And so I think the better foundation we can give kids to be able to do that, the more we can build on that as they go through their schooling. So my doctoral advisor, when I was in graduate school, developed a model for teaching writing that's really a nice step that gets them into writing and or into reading and then thinking through how you could teach it. And in teaching we have this term that we always use called I do, we do, you do. Have you heard that? Any of you who are teachers? But it's the idea that as a teacher I would model for you or tell you what I want you to learn. We do it together and then eventually I could then send you out on your own and you'd be able to do it. Well with writing I think we need a little bit more and I think of that because when I was an English teacher and I was given my first class, I was asked to teach writing and I realized I had no idea how to teach it. I realized that I went into English because I was really good at English and no one had ever taught me how to write, I just could do it. And everything that I had done all through my formative years of schooling, I would write my drafts at two in the morning the night before they were due turn them in, get my grade back, and I was doing just fine. And so I was very worried because my doctoral advisor's son was coming through the high school system while I was studying with her, and I was certain I was going to get him as a student, and I'd be exposed as a fraud, that I had no idea how to teach writing. And I think a lot of that comes from the fact that in schools we don't teach writing. We assign writing. It's something, you're nodding your head, so I know I'm not just making wild guesses. And if anything, we often just kind of throw people off the edge and expect them to write. So I think of it as, and I hope I can share this story from your life, but when my husband Ben was taught how to swim, which you never learned, he was just thrown in and his dad would yell from the side. And I think that's what we do a lot when we do writing in school, we assign students, and then we yell from the side, relax, just relax, but we don't get in there with them and show them how to do it. I know a lot of um, my fellow teachers, when they would teach writing, they would have like one essay that they had written a long time ago, and then they'd assign the writing to their students and sort of step back. So this model, I think, is a really nice way of thinking about writing, and it's Imsky is how we pronounce it, but the first step is that you inquire into how a text functions, how it looks, how the author did what they did. So not only are students reading the text, they're reading for the writer's craft of how they did what they did. And then the teacher should write in front of their students. So when I was teaching high school, if my students were writing research papers, I would write a research paper with them every day that they came into class. I would start with the task that we were doing, I'd write in front of them, and then I would gradually release that so that they could. And then I'd have them work with me, which is shared writing, then I have them write together. And then finally, I think we can get them to independent writing. So we have a lot of experiences where our students can check with somebody, they have support, they have someone guiding them, and we can check in and make sure that they're okay before we throw them over the edge and say, relax, you can do it, and then they drown, which often happens. So some of my wonderings when I started working with Ms. Ward were how can reading and writing be used together better to actually help students become writers? And what kinds of inquiry tasks help students to pay attention to what a text does? 
and how can teachers help to teach children to write informational text so they're ready for writing when Ben Gorman gets them in the secondary grades. So I'll give you a little bit of, I'm going to have you interact with me in a second, but I want to set you up for our study. We did two rounds, and I'm going to talk to you about the adjustments that I made when I worked in Miss Ward's classroom. And I'm going to ask you questions about why you think I made those adjustments, because I think they, for the most part, make logical sense. Because sometimes, and I don't know if you do this when you teach something or explain, I'm an over planner. And so the first year, you're going to find that I over planned and that there were some things to step back on. But in Kim Ward's classroom, there are 26 students in 2013, and then her students went up to 29, year two. This is at Monmouth Elementary School just down the street. So um, the kids in this group are in sixth grade now, and these kids are in fifth grade now. And I'm looking forward to working with them again this year. So round one, what we did first is I had the students pay attention to how a text on a similar topic differed if it was an informational text versus a fictional text. How many of you have read Stella Luna? Okay, those of you who have read Stella Luna, what's it about? I'll give you a clue. She's the bat, and she has a name. She's Stella Luna. Can you think of anything else? It's about her finding a family, about her. And so she's a bat and she's a main character, but she's very personified. She has a character. She has voice. She has a lot of detail about her. Now, those are pretty typical characteristics of fictional text, right? We come across, especially with young readers, we come across a lot of texts where an animal might have a family. They wear clothes. They have a home. They, and maybe those things happen in the real world, but they don't often have names and a bird doesn't call them by name and invite them into their home and those things. But that's what happens with Stella Luna. So I read this out loud to the kids first. And then we read Bats, Biggest, Littlest. And it is a true traditional informational text. So if I were to say what a true traditional informational text is, what would you say uh, typifies that? What do informational texts look like for kids usually? No story, lots of charts. Yeah, no story. There's lots of charts. What else is there? Facts. Lots of facts. And kids love facts, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I can already tell you that the littlest bat in here is the bumblebee bat. And they have a whole page where they show you the bumblebee bat and they give you the stats and what it eats and other things like that. What else do informational texts often have? You can even think of textbooks. Different features than non fictional texts are like glossary, mm -hmm. table of contents things that students need to be explicitly taught how to use. Right. And, and it's a different way of reading than when we read a fictional text, right? And I'll give you, maybe this is too many of my true confessions, but I was an English major through and through, all through my K-12 development. And so when I got introduced to textbooks in junior high and high school, I read like an English literature person. I would read cover to cover. I didn't pay attention to text cues like table of contents, index, glossary, any of those things. Of course I figured that out now as an adult reader because it saves me time, but no one ever really pointed out to me that you read a text differently. A lot of our kids will figure that out, but a lot of our kids will just stop reading. If they don't have a lot of facility with the way a text works, they'll internalize a lot of that feeling of inadequacy and probably stop reading. And I had that experience with a lot of the kids that I worked with at the secondary level. So what we did is we read the two uh, books together, we compared and contrasted them, and then we created a class definition of informational text. And what we really emphasized was that informational texts have information in them. This is where you go to gather lots and lots of information. So then with the model writing, with the book Bats, we pointed out the text features and I did a whole lot of mini lessons with them. And what we did to help the kids figure out how to hold on to their learning is I taught them how to use a note-taking strategy called an eye chart. And I'll show this to all of you. You might want to use it one day. So what we did was I had the kids at the very top of the chart generate questions about what they wanted to know as they read their text. What are bats? What do bats look like? You'll notice that this is disjointed, and I'll tell you why in a second. We didn't study bats and volcanoes. Oh, sorry, I covered the microphone. So what we did was we taught them how to ask questions of text, and then as we read the text, we would fill in their eye chart with the answers. So this chart itself has the questions at the top, 
and then they write their sources down the edge. And what we want kids to start doing, and we would want college students or adults to do this too, is to read from multiple sources. Because what I want kids to understand is that not every text has all the answers, and authors pick certain information to share based on what they want you to learn from it. Right? And in fourth grade, I don't go into a lot of information about bias, but it's a really nice foundation um, that's set for them to help them understand the authors do pick and choose what to include when they write a text. So we had the kids generate questions, and what I would do is model for them. I'd read out loud, and then as I would pull out a question, I would show them how to write that down because a lot of them, when they're reading, need a place to keep their information. If it were words that we were unfamiliar with, then we would underline those so that the kids could hold on to that information later. And you'll notice that with the kids, I didn't go into like APA or MLA citations, but I did show them that you should cite your sources because you don't have to know everything from the top of your head if you're going to write a report. If you write a report, your goal is to go and read widely and to learn from other people so that you can uh, collect that information and then do it on your own. So you'll notice this chart is a little disjointed. This BATS piece is what I did on my own. And then what we had the kids do is we divided them into groups. And the teacher wanted to meet the science standards, which were about weather. And so we had the students reading about weather texts and then doing their own eye charts in groups. And I'll show you a little bit about what that looks like in a second. So they worked in groups of four to five, and they would pull information. And I'll show you a little bit of theirs. Now with this first group, I used something called dash facts with the students, and they would complete their dash facts before they asked their questions. Because I wasn't sure if the kids had a lot of information about earthquakes and typhoons and volcanoes. So we handed them texts, and then they would just collect the information as they read. And you can see that they got some pretty good information. Earthquakes are the shaking and rolling of and shocks of the Earth's surface. And then what we did is we taught them the eye chart. They started to ask their questions, and then they transferred the information from their fact sheets to their charts. Now the power of this is as they go to put their information together, they can take their, their question, turn it into a topic sentence, and put a lot of information together and synthesize it. And so the kids were writing really big pieces of information about earthquakes. And I could teach them many lessons. Like, I don't know if you remember learning how to turn a question into a topic sentence. If you're a reluctant writer, that's a pretty powerful thing. Do you guys do that in your essay writing, even today? If I have a question, especially if I'm not feeling super creative, and I just have to get this assignment done, it's a pretty powerful strategy to be able to take a question and just turn it into a sentence, and then use what I've learned to support that. I'll show you a couple more from the kids. You'll notice that this group, they were reading about typhoons. They collected their facts, and then they would go back and say, OK, which question from my eye chart does it answer? And then they transferred the information to here. I love fourth grade handwriting. So what we did with these kids is once they'd worked in groups, we wanted them to pick whatever topic they wanted and to write about it, to take the process that we had taught them and to write on their own and see if they could do it. Uh, I have two examples, three examples that I'll show you. And they wrote their rough drafts in templates that we gave them. And they look a little like this. And I'll hand these out to you, or you can have copies if you want later. And they could put their pictures in. Um, and then we also had the text structure, so table of contents and glossary. The kids loved the templates. Can you guess why? Why do you think the kids loved these? It encouraged them to draw. It encouraged them to draw, definitely. So a lot of our kids who uh, felt like their writing was weak had another outlet. Why else do you think the kids like the templates? Structure. Yep, it provides a structure for the essay, so I kind of know where to start. It tells them a heading. We left the page numbers blank so they could rearrange them as they revised and edited because information texts don't have to be completely linear. The other reason they liked it is this is way less intimidating than if I hand you a sheet of lined paper. And if you're a kid who already feels like you're not a very good writer or you don't have much to say, 
that's a really discouraging thing to get from your teacher, that you have to write this huge essay just on a piece of paper. I've used this with success even with high school students as a way of getting them to organize their thoughts and getting them to think through where they want to go with an essay before they write a long essay, because it's less intimidating. And sometimes it's just nice to write on something different than lined paper. So I'll show you a couple of examples of what the kids wrote. This is Are You Bored With Boards? This was about circuits, symbols and parts, resistors and connectors. And you can see that there's the drawings that the kids have. The kid, my kid, this was my kid. And what he got to write on. And you can see that their sources are not super big. But they're starting to cite sources, which I imagine high school teachers will love that they already know to do that. The page where you find the information, the glossary. Uh, this is Sage's, and hers was Mighty, Mighty Oaks, What You Need to Know. So you can see they start playing with the language. They have their table of contents. She did her own drawings. And then their headings were questions. So they transferred that specifically. How tall is an oak tree? And then they would write from that. What I like about Sage's at the end is she added her own about the author because that's just as important, right, as having everything else. And then I have um, Isaiah's, and he wrote about sharks. Where can great whites be found? He wanted to not have a picture here, so he said, can I use a glossary page? You can see that they can get as big as helicopters. <laughs> it's a great drawing that he has. And you can see with their glossary that they have the underlined words and the definition. I love this one. I found these sources in a book from the library. So something we'd go back and teach a little more. What we noticed when we worked with the kids is they caught onto this eye chart quickly. As I went into the classroom the rest of the year, they were using these for everything. If they were interviewing their friends, they would have questions up here, and then they would have the sources, and their source would be the friend, and then the other friends. If they were reading a fictional textbook, they'd have questions like, who are the characters? What is the setting? What's the book about? And then their source would be, my friend Jim, or my friend Tony, or my teacher said this. And so they used these with a lot of success. They loved the book templates for moving information around. But what they had a hard time with was transferring information from the dash facts to the chart. Did you already suspect that that might be a problem as you looked at that? It's almost a meaningless step because they wanted to write right onto the chart. And the students were fairly independent by the independent stage. But one of the things that we found when we did this is the kids who were good writers did great. And the kids who struggled still had a lot of need for a lot of help. And so we wanted to revise it the next year and add in one more extra step so that the students had more practice before they went to independent stage. The other thing that we found, especially with fourth graders, is the internet articles were really hard to level to the reading level that they were at. So it was hard to differentiate so that different reading levels could be successful in the small group work. And so I'll talk to you next about how we fix that with the next study. So with that in mind, we added a collaborative independent step and changed a couple things, and I'll show you. We repeated the inquiry that we used in round one, but we also wanted the kids to get past asking the same questions about everything. We felt like what we had taught them gave them one idea of what an informational text is, one idea about kinds of questions. And so we changed that, and we got them thinking about the kinds of questions you ask depending on what you're studying. And I'm going to make you all do an exercise in a second so that you can see what they had to do, too. So we wanted to ask, how can knowing the types of questions help you to understand better information? We overviewed types of nonfiction because we wanted them to realize it's not just about animals, not just about science text, and we discussed different kinds of questions. So this is what I gave them. And we wanted them to figure out what questions they would ask to get the best information about a subject. So what would be the kinds of questions you would have to ask to classify animals best? What do you usually ask if you are looking into a pet or trying to understand an exotic animal? What yeah, what family does it belong to? Because that probably tells you a little bit about the environment that they live in, right? What else are you going to ask about animals? What's their use? What's their use? Yeah, is this a predatory animal? Do I really want it? for a pet? Or are they domestic? What use do they have? Yeah. What else could you ask about animals? 
What do they eat? And that's a big one for kids. They always want to know what they eat, uh, where they live, those kinds of things. Now, if you're asking about food, because I had a few kids who wanted to write recipe books when they wrote their own text, what kind of questions am I asking about food? Healthy or not. Yeah, healthy or not. How many calories? <laughs> For different reasons. What's in it? Yeah, which animal is in the food? If I have food allergies, what kind of food allergies would it be? Can I make it? Is it something that you know I would need a lot of help with? Okay, if I'm talking about Ben Franklin, what kind of questions am I going to ask? I might want to know what Ben Franklin eats. And it might even be a niche I would fill as an author. Like maybe I'm the first author to write about Ben Franklin's foodie <laughs> needs or whatever. But that would be really, really targeted, right? So generally, if I'm studying a person, what kinds of questions am I asking? Why is he famous? Why is he famous? When did he live? When did he live? Where did he live? What did he do? You know, those kinds of things where we might ask that about a particular animal, but not animals in general. And then, what about if I'm studying a place? Kind of the same thing. It depends on if I'm traveling there, if I'm going to move there, but those questions are very different. And it was really cool to see the kids get into that and think about how they could ask the questions and they could generate those and that there was a power in thinking about the differences in the kinds of questions we would ask depending on what we wanted to learn about. And the sequence that we had planned for these students was to do a shared text together, like the BATS text again. And then we wanted them to write about science standards, but we chose not to do weather this time. We chose whales, because in fourth grade, you get to learn about that in Oregon because you live by the ocean. And the teacher had texts about whales that she could put in groups for different reading levels for kids. And then after that, they were moving into a social studies unit, and she wanted them to study people and places. Okay, So I'll show you a little bit about what we did. We did the eye chart again with bats, and they came to the same conclusion. The informational texts are about information. <laughs> they, they, they were really well versed in that. And this time, with the eye chart, we filled out a pre, we pre-filled one for them. Because you'll notice that this one can get pretty unwieldy. Source one, source two, source three, source four. And the other thing we wanted to do is we wanted to figure out what they knew already. Because one of the things we found as we were studying weather is the kids had a lot of misconceptions. And we didn't have them talk about that. And so we had to do a lot of backwards teaching to, do, to address their misconceptions. We wanted them to rely on their classmates more, not just us. So we wanted them to ask their classmates what they knew about uh, their whale, and then we gave them the whale book with an example of how you would cite that. They then did another source, and then we gave them a prompt. These are some big ideas from what I've learned about this question that I definitely want to include in my report. And so they worked on that together. Um, in their groups, they worked in groups of about five to six, and they worked with whale text. They didn't get articles this time. And the groups were assigned different wells to study. They used the pre-filled eye charts. And I'm going to show you some examples of their group books that they made. Aren't those adorable? Wrote about beluga wells. And these were pretty big groups. She had a really big class. But they drew and wrote together. What do they eat? Those were some of their common questions. Where do they live? Do they migrate? And are they endangered? A lot of fourth graders are really concerned about, well, I guess we all should be, but fourth graders are particularly concerned about endangered animals. And you can see that they started to add some voice. Hi, all of you readers. Probably you want to know what beluga whales eat. Well, we're going to tell you. They find food in fresh and salt waters. Now all you readers know what beluga whales eat. Not super detailed, <laughs> but our goal was to get them thinking about the process, right? And you've got seven people working on a book. Beluga whales squirt water into the sand of the muddy bottom of the ocean floor for mollusks and shellfish. So now we're getting a little more detail because another group came in. But notice that they underline their words. They eat worms, fish, octopus, and squid. They, <laughs> there we have an incomplete thought. Where do beluga whales live? Have you ever been to a swimming pool and seen a beluga whale? I don't think so. 
because they live in the Arctic Ocean. They also live in the subarctic regions. Sometimes they go to fresh waters to find new food. And I love this beluga whale. Let's move. Now you know where beluga whales live. Anyway, that's one of them. And you can see that they went through their whole book. Let's see if I can zoom that out. Have you ever wondered if beluga whales are endangered? Well, I have the answer for you. You can see this poor, sad beluga whale with pollution. And how would you feel if you were a beluga whale? And we have our glossary and their books. I feel pretty confident that this group would be pretty ready to write a book. I'll pass them around and I'll just show you the others really quickly. But we were worried about setting them loose on their own with just that one step because group work is sometimes an unreliable predictor of how everyone will do, right? How many of you have worked in groups where you were the one who did all the work <laughs> or you didn't have to do the work? So we wanted to go with one more step, but I'll just show you. This is the killer whales, and I'll pass this around. They were very concerned that killer whales eat humans, and they found out that they don't, and so that was a really nice thing for them. And you can see this really nice shared work. Pass that around. This was a group of our students who, three of them were also brand new English language learners. And you can see that they all participated and were able to put a lot of facts together. I can look at this as a teacher and say that these kids are meeting a science standard, that they can read closely that they can put together lots of information from text, that they can synthesize that, and that they can also demonstrate what they learn. I think the really nice thing about this is writing isn't occurring just in their language arts block. It gets outside of that and goes right into their other subject areas. So I remember when I was teaching high school English, it was sort of this idea that the English teachers taught writing and other teachers would just assign it. And I think that this moves into a lot of where we're trying to go with writing instruction is that every teacher is responsible for teaching their own kind of writing. The other modification that we added to this group was we realized that they had worked in pretty big groups of kids and we weren't sure that every kid could do this. So what she wanted to do with the social studies standards is we knew that they had to study the states in the fourth grade standards. And so we wanted them to all have the same topic but to work on different strands of it. And so with the states reports, they all had to write about states. We developed a question bank that they could all choose from, and then every child got to write about a different state. So we were able to see where kids were individually as they wrote and uh, worked on those reports. So the very last piece after they did that, because we found that most of them were fairly independent after the state report, was to get them writing independently. And then so we had them write biographies. So in social studies, she gave them a list of people that they needed to know about or that they had learned about. And then the kids got to do much like they did with the state report. They were writing the same kind of text, but they each had a different person that they were writing about. And the students, I can say with confidence, were overwhelmingly successful. When we got to the biography portion, every child was writing on their own. We were just there to watch. So they could pull out their eye charts, they knew about the book templates, they knew how to gather information, they knew how to transfer it, and they were really successful. And I'll show you just a few of these examples. So one was writing on Harry Houdini, and you can kind of see that but gathering lots of information. This is one who wrote on Queen Elizabeth, and you can see her eye chart, and now she's moving it into an essay that she'll turn into a book. Uh, this is someone writing on Ulysses S. Grant, and he's gathering lots of information. And what they did to publish their books was they ended up taking them from the templates and then publishing right into PowerPoint because you can cut and paste pictures and it has that organizing structure of a book. So Cosette was learning about Susan B. Anthony. And then we have Brianna who was learning about Barack Obama. And I don't have a copy of this one because we had a student who loved her topic so much that she took it home every night. But we had one student who wrote a 30-page biography of Frida Kahlo. 
and it was gorgeous. <laughs> lots of artwork that she found to put in it, lots of pictures, lots and lots of information. She filled out, I think, about six eye charts and just tons of these template pages. So the question that I have for you as I end and we start talking about other books that connect with this, is there any ideas from this that you could use in your own classroom or with your own kids? The original study that iCharts came from I think is fascinating. What, it's from a researcher named Suzanne Viscovich, and she studied it for her dissertation. And what she did is she used an iChart and webbing and outlining. And she took groups of kids and she had them write an essay. And then she taught the three different structures to three different groups and then had them write a second essay to see which structure made their writing better. Okay, I'm going to make you participate here. The webbing structure, so the spider webbing, how many of you have spider webbed to write an essay? So you have like your big idea in the center and then you have ideas out. The group who were taught webbing when they wrote their final essay all did worse. Why? Because it doesn't help you organize your ideas. Uh -uh. It's totally messy. It's all over the place. It's really good for brainstorming and generating ideas but it's a terrible structure for organizing writing. And so the kids who learned that did worse. Okay, outlining. So that would be like if you have a one, you have to have a two. If you have an A, you have a B. Those students also did worse. Why? Is it too rigid maybe? Yes, that's one of them. It's too rigid. And not all texts follow the structure of an outline. Like a lot of texts will have in one paragraph a comparison and a contrast. And so if I feel like I'm doing a one and then a two, but then a contrasting idea is introduced, it's hard to write another piece. And then I'll give you a personal experience. I know we were taught outlining with rigidity when I was in high school, and I'm a little bit neurotic sometimes. And so I would read texts, and there would be a one, but there wouldn't be a two. And I couldn't keep going on my assignment because the text didn't follow the structure that the teacher had told us it would. So not all kids are like that. But it, it was too rigid, and it really um, made their writing harder. The kids who did the eye chart, there was big groups with the eye chart, they all did much better on their final essay. They wrote more. It was organized. They had ideas to write from. Why? Mm -hmm. I can take a column, right, and write a paragraph straight from this. I taught this to high school kids for five paragraph essays. So if you have to, when in doubt, I don't think the five paragraph essay is the best thing in the world. So I don't really like it at all. But it's a survival mechanism, right? And you can respond to almost any test with a five paragraph essay. So if I have my topic sentences, they're right there. The kids who did the eye chart wrote a lot more. They said it was way harder. So I teach note structures when I teach, uh, I teach content literacy here on campus for future teachers. And I always teach them a different note structure for the readings that we're doing. I teach them about five and then I let them choose for the rest of the term. They never choose this one again <laughs> because they have to think. <laughs> and they just want to get their homework done. And I, I, I give them that, that out. There's a point where you have to do way too much homework. But it's a lot of work. But I think when it comes to writing, it becomes very rewarding with that. So I think eye charts are a useful piece of that. Now, we did this study in another fourth grade class in Utah with persuasive writing. And we used a totally different graphic organizer because we wanted them to think about their claims and then what evidence support their claims and what of their opinion fit it. And so it was a different sort of structure for that. How else could you use any of these ideas if you work with kids or have kids? Or, you know, it's information literacy. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it was really powerful for the kids to have that insight of, oh my gosh, not all texts answer the same questions. And there was one whale book that had contradicting information. Like one of the books said that, I can't remember what whale it was, humpback whale, that it was medium size. It was about if it was the biggest or the smallest, but there was contradicting information. And the kids were like, what do we do with this? And I asked it back to them, what would you do? And they said, we read more books. We need to go see what other sources are out there. Or we could ask an authority. We could ask someone who knows. But I think it's a really nice structure for getting them to get beyond the text as authoritative. Because that's another reason that textbooks are often a turnoff to kids, is they are so authoritative that we ask them to think critically, but there's nothing to think critically about. It just tells them what to think. 
and so they get pretty tired of that. Can you think of any other ways you could use any of this? When you learn to create a text, you learn you can do it differently. So if, if you're doing these things, uh, like if, if you learn how the text goes together and how you make it, next time you read a similar text, you're going to be looking for those things and you're going to understand mm -hmm. what the, the author intended more than you would if you had never created that. So yeah. It's like, it's so cool. And we had a lot of the kids transferring that information. They were able to pick up the textbook is what came next for them. So they were still using the readers provided by their teacher, but she was introducing a textbook the next uh, month, which is one of the reasons we were doing this. And they did. As soon as they picked up the book, instead of reading the assignment, they did a text walk and they looked for structures that would guide them and signposts that would help them with their reading rather than just skimming and, and not getting much out of that. So I imagine if those kids remember those skills, that as they come up through the school system, that they're going to have something that helps them to be a little bit more successful with text. I showed you a very traditional informational text, and that's what we wanted the kids to read from so that they could write that and, and use that with the textbook that they'd be using. But there are amazing informational texts that are being published right now that get kids into subjects, get them into disciplines, and help them to transfer a lot of that information into a more holistic way of thinking. And I brought a handout for, I think there's enough for everybody. There's some paired texts in here that you can have. You don't have to take one if you're not ever going to teach kids or not interested in this, or you might be. But these are paired texts for math, science, and social studies. And they're primarily children's books, but I used children's books when I was a high school teacher with a lot of success. You'll see you know, ones like Math Curse and others. But I'll also pass around some books that have come out recently or are within that that I think a lot of kids are becoming very interested in. So last year, this book was published, or two years ago. Um, and it's about the librarian who measured the earth. And it's a really great text to get kids thinking about math and where it comes from, how we use it, and how this information is passed down. So I'll pass that around. This one's about Nikola Tesla. So they're doing a lot of great biographies on people that kids haven't had source material for in a long time. And it's called Electrical Wizard. And it talks about how he <laughs> worked with electricity and generators and all kinds of wonderful things to create amazing inventions and set the stage for a lot of what we have. So I'll pass these around too. For younger kids, there's some really great books done by Steve Jenkins. I don't know if any of you have seen these with grandchildren. <laughs> these are great. He does paper collages. And this one is called Actual Size. And this one works really great, I would say, for first and second graders. But you could use it up into bigger, uh, up with bigger kids. But it has the actual size of the animal. So you have the atlas moth. And this is what an atlas moth would look like if you had one in front of you. The dwarf goby. The one that always grosses my son out. I'll show you. It's the eye of the squid. That's how big squid eyes are. The head of a bear. An ostrich egg. And then this very last one. I'll pass this around. Well, you can see shark teeth, how big they are. And this one always grosses my son out. And of course, that's great for kids, right? I think it's on this page. No. Sorry. It's the biggest earthworm in the world, and it's that big, the Gippsland earthworm. And this grosses him out every time I show it to him. I think it grosses me out more now. But they grow to 36 inches, so three feet, for an earthworm. Can you imagine? It's like reading Dune or living in <laughs> Dune. There's some great books that have come out, too, just on basic, like, what's chemistry about? And I think a lot of up-and-coming scientists like these. They do a lot more the, to make them look like graphic novels. We're seeing a lot more great publications come out that look like, like comics, but they're really well done. They're very academic. They're very respectable. 
the cartoon guide to chemistry. And I think it's good for kids to read and write and draw and find different ways to represent their information and their knowledge. I think reading from these also helps them to read from the internet better, which a lot of kids will be reading from the internet primarily. And so the way the information is presented is often more in line with the way that information is presented online. Another cartoon guide to calculus. But just some different ways to get kids thinking about how to write nonfiction text. And I find this interesting because in the Chronicle of Higher Ed last month, they focused on a dissertation that was written all in comics. So there was a woman who published a 300-page dissertation all in comics. And it was an academic, very respectable study. <laughs> so I think that's fascinating. And I think that there's a lot of openings for kids as we start to accept broader definitions of what count as text. And a lot more people will see themselves as readers in that. This is another one. There's a series of these. And um, I think this would make a great classroom activity where everybody put together their own dictionary with pictures and information. And then even the good old United States Constitution done in graphic design. Yeah. So this is the kind of work that I would say, not just myself, but a lot of the teachers in teacher ed are doing at Western Oregon University. We love to get out and go into the local classrooms, work with teachers, work with their students, provide them with resources and find ways to enhance our own teaching and theirs. I'll give you a last piece that I did with this, this particular project. When I was teaching a class to my students on how to teach writing, so I have pre-service teachers and they're learning how to teach writing, I was able to get Ms. Ward, they walked the fourth graders over to my class, and then the fourth graders prepared their own sort of lecture for my students on how they could become better writing teachers for their own students when they, be, when they got their first job. And it was a really powerful community-based interaction because those kids had a lot of really good advice. They paid attention to the process that we taught them. They realized that they were being taught writing rather than just assigned writing, and they were able to identify the steps, share them with my students, and there was a really nice uh, back and forth between the two groups, and I think it improved both of their outlooks on how to teach writing. Mm -hmm.